Um, I have to now introduce Eric Howler. Uh, but before that, I think I have to say that there's lunch, right, in the porticos uh, after uh, Eric's presentation. Eric, um, assistant professor of uh, assistant professor of architecture, uh, not of practice, but uh, he has a very good practice as well here um, in Boston. Um, Howler Yoon, uh, adaptive architectures is the topic of your talk, and maybe you can come and give that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Florian. Thanks, Charles uh, and Sergio for the invitation. Um, I want to talk about adaptive architectures um, and how do we define adaptive? I think uh, you could define it as uh, the means by which an organism sort of uh, responds to its environment. And I think we can define uh, organism uh, to include people and buildings uh, and thinking about adaptive architecture. Um, you can say architecture has always been adaptive. It's always been sort of tailored to its context. It's always been site specific. It's always been um, able to sort of transform towards uh, its site and its context. I want to expand environment also to include um, other actors, so uh, other humans, animals, uh, and so on. So we could argue that architecture has always been adaptive, but in a way it's needing to relearn how to be adaptive uh, for the present moment. Um, so um, what is this? forward. Okay, so um, you could also argue that architecture is a kind of broadcast medium. Uh, if you think about the Gothic cathedral as a kind of early form of communication, it's using environmental effects like sunlight and uh, material uh, to produce effects on the ground. These effects create a sense of wonder, and that wonder uh, helps to, uh, uh, to uh, advance the mission of the cathedral, which would be a kind of architecture of persuasion. Uh, I like this image because it also shows a kind of playful aspect of it and the kind of engagement aspect of it. The interaction uh, within architecture is, I think, what makes it um, um, delightful, I guess, to use Celia's term. Um, we could also say that uh, adaptive architecture, like the Flatiron Building here, had always been sort of calibrated. Uh, these awnings um, here, uh, all the way up to Flatiron Building, actually show it sort of responding to its climate. So even in the kind of modern, pre-modern, early modern, um, these buildings are responding to climate uh, in explicit and, and evident ways. Um, I was reading Daniel Barber's text about the Brie Soleil, and he argues that the Brie Soleil was actually a moment where architecture went from being modern to being global, and the Brie Soleil actually acknowledges a kind of positioning and a ability to sort of calibrate. So Le Corbusier's sort of failed curtain wall uh, on the left, sort of retrofitted with the Brie Soleil on the right, sort of acknowledged its sort of positioning within the world, and the specifics of uh, a kind of mitigation technique. Um, architecture, especially modern architecture, has had a kind of uh, challenging relationship to its context. You could argue it's always sort of sell, set itself apart uh, from its context, set itself apart from environment. Mises' skyscraper uh, renderings from 1921 imagine a kind of pure, kind of crystalline world uh, apart from its context, a kind of air apart, uh, and I think that's interesting. Uh, looking at Mies and looking at how he sort of frames views of nature, uh, nature is to be looked at, it's to be regarded, it's to be consumed, uh, but it's always uh, at a distance. Um, and the minimalization of the mullions and the glass uh, suggests a kind of desire to erase the kind of the, the material of architecture. In fact, Mies' uh, architecture of almost nothing uh, is here undone by this decals that have been applied to it. So even though as he's aspiring to a kind of a dissolving of the material of architecture, the decals sort of show a kind of organism adapting or trying to adapt, uh, or other organisms trying to preserve those organisms that are trying to adapt uh, by sort of reinscribing that surface plane of the glass. Uh, also, the Neue National Gallery famously had a condensation issue where the kind of condensation on the glass was somehow reinscribing that plane. So as much as Mies tried to sort of erase it, here it is somehow re-emphasized. Uh, re um, I want to show um, adaptive architecture in three projects. One of the projects is a kind of research, design research project we did with Merck. Merck is a German chemical company that uh, we don't think about in terms of architecture too much. Uh, they are known for uh, liquid crystals. And so every display device has liquid crystals that Merck produces. And so what does that mean for architecture? Um, I think uh, the potential for liquid crystals in architecture as they scale up uh, has incredible potential to provide a product at an architectural scale that could offer optical variability, so switchable glass um, for solar control. Seems to be a huge opportunity. 
um, the dimensional limits are part of the problem right now, but you could imagine those being overcome. They hired us to say, what is the potential for switchable glass for a liquid crystal in architecture? And this is an image that they produced, sort of um, imagining how you could change that with that, um, and then showing it in the insulated glass unit where a layer of liquid crystal would be located. And I think what this does is it just expands our kind of repertoire of what we use, whether it's tinting, coating, low emissivity, thermoplastic spacers, fritting, all the devices that we have to control sun. The benefit of this one is that it's switchable, so we can control it um, in any way uh, we choose. And um, as we know, the challenges, thank you, Sal, for uh, solar heat gain uh, on urban surfaces, glass is such an efficient uh, surface for architecture if you don't think about the sun. In the sun, it becomes uh, a nightmare. And so the question is, you know, is glass, could glass actually be uh, recovered as a building material that would be sort of solar appropriate. Um, everyone says, you know, could, it, could this building be really lead platinum? Uh, can you really have a green uh, skyscraper? Um, they're trying really hard. This is low iron glass, so it's absolutely tra as transparent as it can be, and then they're fritting it to sort of mask the spandrel. But you still have to ask the question, uh, is this really an appropriate use of a material? Uh, if this material had uh, this liquid crystal uh, coating as a layer within it, you could imagine that it could be manipulated uh, quickly, slowly, subtly uh, to produce a whole range of different um, environmental benefits. Um, I found this image really intriguing because it's a TV set in a storefront um, and people are looking at TV through the storefront. Uh, and I also uh, appreciate this image that the TV uh, is in a way the kind of desire for uh, a screen, a kind of window. So the TV is window, or the TV in the window. How could TV technology actually sort of replace a window? How could display technology come and sort of uh, apply itself to architecture? And this is not a new idea. Think of Bob Venturi and the idea of buildings as billboards, buildings as display devices. And so I think there's a lot of potential to think about a kind of display architecture, an architecture that communicates, an architecture that has the potential to broadcast. Um, in different ways. And what it does is it turns surfaces into interfaces. Uh, every surface becomes available for information, for display, for thermal and solar regulation. Um, thinking about our environments and looking at screens to sort of looking through screens uh, as architecture tends to do, how do we think about screens as transparent di display devices? So these are things that we're sort of thinking about in a kind of primitive way, but communicating surfaces, uh, surfaces that have information embedded in them. Uh, not just sort of looking at it, but also to touch a screen, the idea of touching uh, surfaces uh, and the potential for gesture recognition and other uh, interactions. So architecture might become more like an interface, more like a graphic user interface. Um, we've been playing around with sensitive uh, touch sensing uh, in very uh, primitive uh, applications, but we do think there's tremendous potential for uh, the kind of uh, touch sensing uh, display architecture that could sort of transform surfaces into um, into something else. Um, so that's at the scale of the kind of particle. Um, and I wanted to show two more projects, one at the scale of a pavilion and one at the scale of a performance. So um, we were asked to do a, a, a project in Phoenix. Phoenix is extremely hot and sunny, as you can imagine. Um, it's a part of a streetscape. And the idea was how can we sort of improve that streetscape uh, by placing a series of public parasols uh, similar image to Sylvia's, we were sort of struck by, you know, these guys uh, line up uh, in the shadow of the flag in Mexico City. Uh, but we thought, this is so interesting, people sort of gather in the, shat in the shade. Uh, and how do you make place? In Phoenix, you have to make shade. And so we designed this, p this parasol as a kind of shade maker. Uh, but not just a shade maker, actually a shadow maker. Um, and so we started playing with material, thinking how could we create an, an object or a cell that could actually cast shadows and kind of create patterns. Uh, there's something beautiful about just the way the sun sort of tattoos itself across the ground. So one cell aggregated uh, and then optimized uh, to uh, create a, a kind of packed uh, parasol uh, and is dist distributed across the Ro Roosevelt Row uh, in Phoenix. Oops, I'm just gonna fast forward that. Um, so at the end of the day, we fabricated this uh, steel uh, canopy uh, in Phoenix, we also thought, you know, it shouldn't just be solid, it should actually let some light through, allow for natural ventilation, and sort of, uh, we sort of oriented it to ensure that during the hottest time of the day, you would actually get the, the sun um, 
coverage, but in other times of the day, it would let some light through and create those patterns. Um, fabrication required optimization. Uh, obviously, the cell is not a super efficient structural uh, spanning element, so the cellular idea sort of ran in the face of a kind of structural logic. Uh, but we did work on a kind of optimized uh, system to pack and transfer loads across the cells. Uh, we found a local fabricator that could help us fabricate these panels uh, into cells by folding quarter inch steel plate, uh, one uh, canopy. Uh, and then we just wanted to make sure that there were moments where it would be highly transparent and moments would be very opaque. And so these are just sort of simulating some of those views. Uh, we also thought, um, wouldn't it be interesting to use the geometry of this to sort of address the sun and, and maybe produce some power? So. Uh, some of them were uh, filled in and uh, uh, outfitted with some PVs, uh, which allows them to then sort of produce some power uh, locally and then at nighttime sort of play back that power generation through a, a kind of lighting effect in the cells. Um, so a very modest project. It was actually submitted as a, as a competition, as a, as a public art project. Uh, but I think it does sort of exhibit some uh, techniques and thinking about how do you uh, work in an extreme climate? How do you create place? How do you sort of build a kind of behavior amongst people uh, that would actually gather in a place like this where it's 100 degrees um, outside in the middle of the day? Um, and we like to think that uh, we can actually change people's sort of behaviors in those contexts to encourage them to slow down, to sit down, to gather, to interact. Uh, and that's the kind of idea of you know, building, going from building to kind of behavior. Uh, by thinking, uh, I think, smartly about, uh, about environment, about uh, climate context. Um, so, um, and there it is at night, sort of illuminated off-grid. Um, the next project I want to show, this is the last one, is um, a proposal for Dubai 2020. Uh, it was something that we were invited to by Todd Macover at the Media Lab. He was hired to produce a performance piece for the Dubai Expo. Um, and the brief was to create a pavilion where you would uh, uh, expose people to, uh, to the latest research on empathy. This is called the Empathy Pavilion. So um, it's really about sort of getting people together, getting people to sort of interact with each other. And through a series of different workshops and lab spaces, uh, you could teach empathy. This was the, the objective here. Uh, so we worked with Todd to sort of develop uh, the kind of choreography of the experiences, but also the kind of framework that would actually house these different uh, experiences that he was looking for. The site given uh, was a very prominent site right off of the kind of main square. Uh, it had a, a large kind of south-facing uh, exposure, um, and the entrance was actually from, from the north side. Um, we thought, in Dubai, how do you make space? How do you sort of um, protect from the sun? Uh, and our strategies were similar. We thought if we could sort of create a solid shape, uh, embed a kind of spiral circulation of these large performance spaces on the inside, and then let people out in a way uh, that allowed them to spiral down through a series of urban balconies that had been sort of carved out to produce some self-shading. Uh, so breaking down the kind of hard line between inside and outside, uh, between the conditioned and the unconditioned. And working with Transsolar, we sort of developed an idea that uh, maybe semi-conditioning in certain contexts would be acceptable if we sort of regulated the humidity and other um, ways to use radi radiant uh, cooling so that it's not about a kind of hard uh, entry and exit, but these kind of um, extended kind of thresholds of going in and coming out. So um, we did the kind of uh, the studies to show, um, you know, noon sun. Actually, the sun is pretty high in Dubai, so it's coming down at a pretty sharp angle. So you can create a fair amount of self-shading um, and use these surfaces uh, for uh, these uh, exit sort of promenade. Um, this is the actual entry point. Uh, these pavilions always have these huge queues, and so we wanted a, a very generous space that you could sort of gather before you go in, uh, providing a lot of, uh, oops, a lot of, is there a back? There we go, okay. A lot of um, information in the underbelly before you sort of enter. Uh, these things always have kind of clues about, you know, oh, how do I get up there uh, onto the, I can't deal with this. Um, Onto the balcony. So um, we developed this, I think, to a fairly high uh, degree of detail, thinking about uh, the entry point, the kind of antechamber, the sequence from this space into that space, um, sort of rising up in the building over a kind of 45-minute sort of uh, choreographed um, set of experiences. 
Um, this is uh, a, a space for these kind of group interactions before you sort of go up again, experience these kind of lab environments with different researchers. Uh, there's a number of researchers doing neurological work on, on empathy. How can we teach that? How do we engineer that? Um, and then going up to the final performance space uh, where you'd come up here, enter this space, and sort of participate in a kind of group uh, performance before being sort of exit, uh, dumped out here onto this balcony and then sort of circulating down and around uh, there. Um, we worked this out with, um, with Atelier, um, Atelier One, uh, structural engineers, and Transolar, and Bureau Happold uh, to figure out how to um, sort of structure it with these sort of large mega trusses uh, and these sort of big carve outs. Um, the idea of the envelope is that it's highly opaque. Uh, obviously, for these internal oriented performance spaces, uh, having a lot of light was not necessary. Um, and uh, bringing light in, um, I think I have a section here where um, this is opaque, uh, and we can actually turn this sort of um, amphitheater into a set of uh, a kind of louvered um, treads to bring natural light in in a very diffuse way. Uh, where we can, um, but otherwise uh, very much a controlled uh, lighting um, scheme. Um, mega trusses, trying to avoid the, the kind of big uh, performance spaces, um, allowing for that big cantilever and then hangers, hangers down where we, where we can uh, get the hangers in, um, framed out. Um, and then the, the kind of uh, idea about how do we use uh, radiant cooling in certain spaces to sort of lower, lower perceived uh, temperature into a kind of comfort zone? Um, and Bureau Happold sort of worked sort of very quickly, you know, with, with the kind of scheme. They sort of said, well, I do this, this, and this. Um, but I think the big gesture was essentially how do, we, um, how do we ensure that these balconies are actually inhabitable, you know? And uh, talking to Thomas Auer from Translar, he's like, actually, the sun's pretty high at the worst case. So, you know, as long as you've got that sort of deep cut, uh, you're, you're going to be uh, pretty okay, if okay means like 40 degrees. Um, but I think the expo actually shifted their dates so that they're actually opening and, and spending the winter months, so it's not the hottest time of the year, which makes sense. Um, looking at these simulations just to sort of see where, uh, you know, you might have some dark blue and the edges would obviously be hot, but, you know, stepping in off of, away from the edge, you would get the, the kind of self-shaded portions that aren't sort of re-radiating heat because they haven't been exposed to the sun. Um, uh, and these are sort of Transolar's sort of ideas about you know, the different environments as you're moving from one lab to the other. Um, you could experience different degrees of comfort. It's not about a single sort of idea about what is comf comfortable, uh, but actually experiencing the difference between different zones, different sort of climatic, interior climatic zones. Um, so you could argue that um, the extended balcony is a way to sort of extend the kind of uh, the, the exit from the building so you're not sort of uh, um, coming out and confronted with this sort of very dramatic and abrupt uh, transition from inside to outside. Uh, a view from the uh, entry. Um, oh, these are from some of the exhibition spaces, and that was the performance hall. Um, exiting, um, trying to figure out the ADA uh, in this was a challenge. Um, and then looking back uh, from the, um, I guess this is the south, south side. Well, it deposits you on this on this um, sort of tunnel that puts you back out. So, um, what does this mean for architecture? Um, you know, our architecture has always been adaptive. We think about pre-modern architecture doing a great job of, of sort of calibrating buildings. And, and I love this. I wanted to show it's Jantar Mantar in Delhi, uh, a kind of set of structures that are actually these kind of astronomical instruments. So you can kind of inhabit. Uh, a sundial, you can inhabit uh, this uh, incredible, um, it looks like a stair to nowhere, but it's actually sort of citing um, um, certain uh, alignments. Uh, and this one, it blows my mind, it's a kind of, uh, it's a spherical sort of Boolean extrusion uh, in the ground uh, where wires are stretched across to cast shadows onto this map. Uh, and the cutouts actually allow you to sort of go in there. So it's a kind of, it's a beautiful space of like, I can inhabit this instrument, the, you know, and, and that's what really kind of struck me, uh, whoops, um, is that, you know, architecture, you know, is obviously for programming for use, for performance and so on, but it is also an instrument to be calibrated and these are explicitly instruments, um, but I think architecture could take on that, that idea uh, that it can be calibrated. We have the technology, we have the tools to sort of really fine tune it uh, into something that's not just um, 
kind of brute force performing, but actually performing somehow in concert or adapted to perform in concert with uh, the context, both climate and cultural. Thank you.